right, well, how's everybody doing this morning? Let me hear where you're at. That was, you know what, I mean, this, we're three months in, people, and I don't want, you know, I don't want to come down hard on you right off the top, but I am going to need a little bit of help. We are responsive. We are turning to God's word. It's a life-changing word. Come on, just turn to your neighbor and say, live free. Turn to the other side and say, get free. Now, let's try that one more time. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, my goodness. High school pep rally. It's going to be fun. So good. Uh, I want to take a moment right off the top of the message before we jump right into the Bible, which we're going to get there. We are Bible people. We're going there right away. But I want to give a little shout out to some people that just really deserve uh, a shout out and some thanks. I want to give a shout out this morning to our Resonate uh, group leaders. These are people that help us do life together here at Resonate. We are coming to the end of our first ever Resonate groups session, which we've been going now for the last 11 weeks. And we're going to take the summer off. We do that. We believe in providing rest for our leaders. We know that you need a rest. But also at the same time, we don't rest from doing life together over the summer. So in a moment, I'm going to let you know about some stuff that's coming up that you can just be part of, feel part of the family and connected around here. But before we do that, would you just take a moment and just show some love for our Resonate Group host that just invested the last 11 weeks of their life into doing community around here? Can we put our hands together for that group in this place? I see Jane here. Ben and Ginny, there's many more that I, I, I can't see. There's bright lights in my eyes, but we appreciate every one of you uh, so much, the investment that you make. We say that we train our leaders uh, in this. We say every time we do small group sessions or resonate group sessions, the purpose of that time is, is really just two things. Get to know everyone who's in your group and help them take what would be their next step in faith. It's really that simple. That's the design of our groups, to find ourselves in a place where you are known personally enough that someone can be helping you take your next step in Jesus. And every one of us, even for myself, there is a next step for me in the, every season of my life. And so that's the goal. That's, the, that's why we do them. And so this fall, when we jump back in, uh, you can find yourself a group. But this, this summer, we're going to be doing lots of stuff that will build community. And I want to let you know about two of those things. Uh, we're going to let you know a lot more about these things in coming weeks, but I want you to get these things in your calendar. First of all, Wednesday, July the 5th. Wednesday, July the 5th, we are having a team night, and it is going to be all of our team. Whether you're a part of our dream team now uh, or whether you are just looking to get involved, uh, obviously Next Steps is the place to really get involved, but our team's going to be gathering. You don't have to be part of our team to come to that night, but it's going to be culture building, team building, exciting time together. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to keep that date free. As well, on Saturday, July 15th, we are having our serve day. And we're going to be partnering with hundreds of churches across North America in all out serving our community that day. We run serve day through our Resonate groups, which means that if you're a part of a group, your group leader will be already uh, finding and maybe even working with you to find a community need that you can meet on that day. But if you're not a part of our groups, again, you can be a part of that. And if you want information just like where and when and how all that stuff's going on, just grab the Connect card in your seat this morning, fill out your email address. We will get you on our update list, and we will give you all that information. And that's a safe card to fill out. You don't have to worry. Like, I am not uh, going to be sending you, um, I'm not going to be sending you the, like, the forwards I get on Facebook from, like, um, Rachel's grandpa. He's great on Facebook. I love him. He's wonderful. But some of those forwards, like, they're, you know, it's just like, it's just kind of funny stuff, but it's, you know, it's a lot. It comes kind of like every other day, and we love you, Grandpa. We're filming this, Grandpa. Come on, man. We love you, Grandpa, on Vancouver Island. Love you. Uh, the Facebook's a little much. Uh, that's not what I'm going to be doing uh, with the updates from church. These come at the most once a week, and they just keep you involved and in invited. We just want you to feel invited. Come on, just give yourself a hug. Just feel invited. I went to a children's concert last night with my daughter. She, the, the woman was like, you need to hug yourself four times. Is the best I felt all week. Come on, just do it. <laughs> Oh, so good. Let's get to the Bible this morning. Galatians chapter 2, we're picking up right where we left off last week in verse number 15, and this is what the Bible says. It says, we ourselves are Jews by birth. Now, Paul is writing, uh, is speaking of himself, and he's writing to a group of Gentiles. So the, the context here is he's, he's kind of illustrating some of these Jew-Gentile differences, and if you've been around through this series, you know why. But he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because 
By works of the law, no one will be justified. We unpacked that word justified last week. Phenomenal, theologically deep word that will change the way you look at yourself and your relationship with God. And you can, as Rach said, jump on our podcast. Reading on verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Paul is saying, listen, if I've been saved by Jesus, it's totally sanctified, justified in my life. And, and then if after the fact uh, I'm found to be in sin, is Christ then a servant of sin? He says, certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, this is a heavy statement we'll unpack. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Can we pray together? Would you join me in prayer? Come on, just don't listen to this prayer. Just join with me in prayer. God, we thank you that in this place, in these next few moments, we will share together that we are going to get closer to Jesus. And when we do, we are going to be amazed at the grace of God, the love of God. In fact, it's going to be so overwhelming to us that we won't even be able to leave the same way that we came in. Thank you that this is your good purpose. It's the reason you've sent the Holy Spirit to constantly be filling and transforming our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for what you will do in this place by your Spirit. And everybody said? Amen, amen. How many in the room this morning... Uh, you enjoy a good movie. Not a trick question. We're not about to like, you know, just judge you and say you shouldn't. No, just how many you enjoy a good movie. I used to, I used to like movies. Uh, I, was, I was a movie fan. But I have found that we do not watch a lot of movies anymore. And I don't want to throw Rachel under the bus this early in a message. But, you know, uh, <laughs> one of the reasons I don't like movies anymore is that in 12 years of being married, I am convinced that never one time has Rachel stayed awake from the beginning until the end of a movie. We discovered this on our honeymoon. We were on our honeymoon, and when I say that I'm going to talk about our honeymoon, you all freak out, and you're like, don't make it awkward. I won't. So we were on our honeymoon, and we put on a movie. It was a rom-com, and we got to the end of the movie, and I turned to Rachel. I was like, oh, that was awesome, wasn't it? She was sleeping, and I was okay, well, when did you fall asleep? And got her to describe the last thing she remembered, and it was like five minutes into the movie, and I was like, what? I was so dialed in, and it was a rom-com, right? So I felt a bit weird, but I was dialed. So then the next night, I was like, okay, well, you know, we're going to watch this movie again, and we watched the whole thing again, literally from the five-minute in part where she said she fell asleep to the very end. I get to the end of the movie, and I'm like, I felt it again. The second time, I was like, that was good. I turned to Rachel. I'm like, baby, that was, she's sleeping again. I'm like, where did you fall asleep? And it was like 10 minutes in. So we don't watch a lot of movies anymore. And I do enjoy a good rom-com. Like one of my favorite genres, it's not really macho, but I like the good, like I like the Victorian romance ones, you know, where like, like Pride and Prejudice all day long. You know what I mean? Right? Guys, you with me? Okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, you know, if we're watching a rom-com, this, I mean, Rachel kind of likes to poke fun at me for doing this. And uh, she doesn't, you know, make fun of me all that much, but this is an area where she kind of like, she kind of gets me, and so uh, when we're watching a rom-com, there'll be that line, there's always like a good cheesy line in a rom-com, it's the, you know, the female lead will say, I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy, asking him to love her, and I can feel her eyes in the side of my head, like I know she's looking to see how much I'm enjoying it, and I'm trying to be straight-faced, but I just got chills, you know what I mean, like I'm just like, <laughs> She just, she's looking at me, she's like, you like that, didn't you? I'm like, I no. <laughs> you know, the, so I like rom-coms, but another type of genre that I like, I like action movies. And I like the good guy gets the bad guy action movies. Not like I'm Canadian, so not the good guy shoots the bad guy. The good guy just like cuffs the bad guy, takes him off, right? It's Canadian. So I like the good guys get the bad guys movies. And I want, we want to set up the text this morning. By telling you a little, a little movie plot, and this is never going to get green-lighted by a, a movie studio in Hollywood, because this is too unrealistic to be true, but let me set up the text this way. Imagine that we're watching an action movie. And in this action movie, the good guy is going after the bad guy, and the good guy gets to wherever the bad guy was, and when he arrives on the scene, he finds that the bad guy is already dead. He finds the bad guy dead, and normally we would think, okay, well, that's kind of like, you know, the end of that bad guy. He will go to where 
he would normally go to a morgue or whatever the case may be. It's getting a little morbid, but stay with me. Uh, but that's not what the good guy does. The good guy puts cuffs on him, throws him in the car, and drives him to the courthouse. And when they get to the, go- the courthouse, the good guys you know, say, we are charging this man with the death sentence. That movie's not going to get greenlighted because it's absolutely, utterly ridiculous, is it not? The reason it is ridiculous is that once the law finds that a man is dead, the man is no longer under the law. Once the law discovers that a man is dead, the punishment is complete. There can be no more punishment meted out on this person. And that is exactly what Paul is arguing here as he comes to this crescendo close to the first third of this book of Galatians. He says that he is, he's died to the law. Paul, through these first couple of chapters, has been taking us on a little bit of a, a journey where he is pushing back strongly against the words of a group of false teachers that have slipped into these churches that he planted. It's, just been, a, it's been two years since he planted this multiplicity of churches in the region of Asia Minor. It's just been two years. But he begins to hear report after report after report that there's false teachers there. These false teachers are teaching something different than Paul taught about Jesus. And at first it sounds sort of like what Paul's teaching, but it's actually completely different. And to propagate this message, these false teachers are actually trying to defame Paul. They want to defame him so much that they actually send spies to follow him around to dig up some dirt on Paul. And so... For the first two chapters, Paul has been giving us his alibi, his ministry credentials. He's saying, yeah, I, was, I was here for three years, and then 15 days in Jerusalem, and then 14 years of ministry, and then back in Jerusalem. He's giving his credentials for ministry, and it's all just been pushing back against these false teachers. And Paul wants to give his credentials, not because he wants to boast, but because he actually realizes the danger of the message that the Galatian church has fallen prey to. I'm sure at first it didn't sound all that different to them. It sounded a lot like what Paul had taught because these false teachers actually believed in Jesus. So it wasn't Jesus isn't good. It was, no, Jesus is good. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus is great. You need Jesus to be saved. Jesus is necessary. Jesus, Jesus, yes, Jesus. But after you've been saved by the grace of Jesus, you then need to add to your faith this way of living. And they were pointing back to the Old Testament law and saying, Oh, well, first of all, you need to be circumcised. And second of all, you need to obey some food laws. And there's all these laws that you need to now obey if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, listen, that is not just a slightly different variation of the gospel that I preached to you. Paul actually uses the word desertion. He says, you have deserted the gospel. Because you can't start with Jesus and move on to self. He says, it is Jesus from start To finish, we said this, and and it's kind of been a real theme for the series, that Jesus is not a down payment on a house that you pay for the rest of your life. It is always, only, ever Jesus. Your right standing before God is only ever Jesus. It is never, ever, ever to do with how you live your life. Understand, because if it was, Jesus died for nothing. If it's got to do with you, then it doesn't have everything to do with him, and it always has everything to do with him. So Paul is pushing back against these false teachers, and they're spying on him. And he said in verse 17 today at the beginning of our read, he says, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. And here's here's what's happened here. These, these These legalists were spying on Paul. They're listening to him preach this grace message. They're saying this grace message is too easy. I mean, aren't people just going to live however they want? And so they're going to go and they're going to say, we're going to see if we can find Paul do anything wrong. And so they're spying on him. And Paul says, we too were found to be sinners. And really what he's saying is, these legalists, they come along and they're watching Paul and his buddies. And they say, oh my goodness, they're sinning. And so they say, oh Paul, we get it now. We get it. Okay. We get the message that you're preaching. You're saying that you're free from the law so that you and your friends can go and live however you want to. See, if you still sin, they're saying to him, is Jesus then a servant of sin? And Paul, Paul pushes back against this. And he says, absolutely not, because the freedom that we have in Christ is not the freedom to live however we want to live. <clears throat> I'm going to be free to take a drink right now. The freedom... 
that we have in Christ Jesus is not the freedom to live however we want. In fact, that's one of the most profound definitions of bondage. Because you and I have things that we want to do today that are completely disconnected from what we want in our future, right? So the freedom that we have is not freedom to do whatever we want. And that's what Paul pushes back here and is saying, even though we were found as sinners, it doesn't mean Christ is a servant of sin. And, and they're, they're saying grace is too easy. And Paul goes on and says this in verse 19, but he says, Through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. Through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. To God, and right here, <clears throat> we are about to dive, go off the uh, off the diving board into some beautiful theological depth. And so, as Rachel did this morning, I think it was so helpful, ministered to me. Just kind of take a deep breath. We're going to dive in. <clears throat> We're going to be under the water for a few minutes in some deep theological stuff. So just get a few deep breaths. Okay, let's dive in. Most evangelical theologians <clears throat> will break down the aspects of the Old Testament law into three categories. Three categories. And the Bible actually doesn't categorize them in this way, but we can largely group them into three different areas. There is ceremonial law, there's judicial law, and there's moral law. And you're already saying to yourself, why are we going through all this? Here's why this is an important deep dive theologically. When we understand (coughs) why God gave the law and what it means to us today, you will then know why you read the Old Testament and what it means for you today. So this is important, right? This is going to actually help you have a love for your Bible, which is important to growing your faith. So there's three aspects of the Old Testament law, ceremonial, judicial, and moral. Let's walk them through. Ceremonial law. What's a ceremonial law? Ceremonial law included all the sacrificial elements of the law. It's the like, if you sin, take a bull, go to the temple, kill the bull with the priest, do some stuff with the blood. It's the ceremonial law, and that's throughout the Old Testament, you find that. Now, ceremonial law has been completely fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is once and for all sacrifice. There never, ever, ever needs to be another sacrifice because Jesus has paid it all on the cross. The wrath of God was meted out in his body on the cross once and for all. And so every time we read that kind of stuff in the Old Testament, what it ought to cause us to do is, thank you, Jesus. Then I don't ever have to do that. I read it to understand how messy and grotesque and awful sin is because it absolutely destroys my life from the inside out. So I see that there. But I am so thankful that you did it all for me once and for all. So when you read the ceremonial law, the sacrificial stuff, that's what you get from it. This other aspect of ceremonial law would, uh, would be the food laws, dietary restrictions that we see in the Old Testament. And you might be aware of some of these. And again, these are completely fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The book of Acts chapter 10, Jesus actually says all foods are clean, and so you can eat whatever you want to. It might not be good for you, but you can eat whatever you want to. That's the ceremonial laws. Secondly, there's judicial laws. Judicial laws, you find these all throughout the Old Testament as well. These are things like uh, Exodus chapter 21, which says, paraphrasing, but basically says, if you dig a a ditch and then you cover it over, which kind of defeats the purpose of your ditch. But if you did that, you dug a ditch, and then you covered it over, and then your neighbor had an ox or a donkey, and it fell into the ditch, you need to give your neighbor some money to buy another donkey or another ox, hopefully one that is smart enough to now notice the cover that you built over the ditch you dug. There's a lot of judicial laws, and, and these, again, are completely fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you, when you read these things, you realize, man, God was wanting to shape the future and destiny of of a nation to pull them out of a whole bunch of junk that was happening around them. And these are the uh, judicial laws of the Bible, completely fulfilled 100% in the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we read those, we understand, again, Jesus has done it all for us. Then we get to the moral laws, and this is where it gets awesome and interesting. Because we've been reading throughout this series, you know, justified and free from the law, live free, live free, live free. And then we get to moral law. And the moral law, this is things like the Ten Commandments, or uh, at least the moral imperatives of the Ten Commandments. And we know from Paul's letters that God did not free the church from the moral imperatives of God's moral law. For example, I'll give you an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says... Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. And then he tells them why they're to flee from sexual immorality. And what's he say? He says, I'm going to reference Genesis. 
God made the two one, and the two shall become one flesh. So the argument he makes for fleeing from sexual immorality is not simply that it's bad for you, which is true, but he actually goes back to the law and he pulls out the moral imperative. This is why God did what he did. He wanted to put two together in one space. So Paul pulls out of the moral imperatives of the law an application that comes into the lives of believers today. See, the moral law carries forward. So we don't lie, we don't steal, we don't cheat. We don't do those things because the moral law carries forward. And the moral law is beautiful because the moral law is not God just saying, hey, don't do this, just some, like some sort of random thing. The moral law is not God just putting some boundaries or restrictions on your life that just seem random and don't have anything to do with anything. What's the moral law of God? It's God's character. Right? Why do we follow the moral law? Why, do, why does this carry forward? Because we want to be more like God. Now, so both Paul and these legalists would have been teaching and telling these Christians to obey the moral imperatives of the Old Testament, specifically the Ten Commandments, and mostly they're wrapped up in there, but for totally different motives and totally different reasons. So Paul would be saying things like, if there is anything between you and God, whether it's your money, your stuff, even your family, if something is standing between you and an all-out relationship with God where your heart is actually his, then you need to deal with that thing. That's commandment number one. That's the moral imperative behind commandment number one. The moral imperative behind commandment number four, this is a bit more of a tricky one, the Sabbath, because other aspects of, of the New Testament tell us that we're free from the Sabbath law in and of itself as a you must do this. Paul saying you observe days and weeks and months and so on. Um, that's another message another day. But the moral imperative of that commandment absolutely reigns true in our lives. You need to rest and you need to honor God with your time. That, that carries forward, 100%. I want to read so, you know, some words that are so uh, eloquent and profound from the great German reformer Martin Luther. He puts it this way. I love these words. This is in the preface to his commentary on the book of Galatians. He says, it is an absolute and unique teaching in all the world to teach people through Christ to live as if there were no law or wrath or punishment. In a sense, they do not exist any longer for the Christian, but only total grace and mercy. Once you are in Christ, the law, now Luther here, he's speaking of the moral imperatives of the law. The law, once you're in Christ, the law is the greatest guide for your life. So he's saying, through Christ, you can now live as if there were no law or wrath or punishment. But once in Christ, that law becomes a guide for your life. And so Paul and these false teachers would have been saying some of the same things to follow and obey. But the impetus behind it is totally different. Because false teachers were saying, you need to do those things to get to God. And Paul's saying, no, you need to do those things because that's who God is. And God wants to change you from the inside out to be like him. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Paul says, I am dead to the law. I am crucified with Christ. He goes on and says that exact thing in verse 20. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. I am like that bad dead guy. I'm dead. The law has no more power over me in my life. The law is powerless over me. The purpose of this series and screaming again and again and again, live free, get free. The law, you are dead to the law, is not to make you feel like you never sin. No, sin is real. Every single day we miss the mark on God's best for our lives. And so the purpose is not to, to believe that we don't sin. We do sin. And when we sin, the Holy Spirit comes along, convicts our heart of sin so that we can turn back to God and be again in his embrace and total grace and mercy. Of course, the Holy Spirit convicts us just so that we turn to look more like Jesus. The difference is this. When you're dead to the law, the law can no longer condemn you. And so that means when you sin, Conviction comes to turn you back to God so you can be more like God. But if you feel condemnation, if you begin to wonder, does God love me? Is he with me? Is he for me? Does he still have a plan for my life? I've messed up too much. I've gone too far. I'm too far away from him. I've messed up. My joy is gone. I'm broken. I'm a wreck. You need to understand that you're free from the law. You know what you need to do in that moment is you need to step forward. And the law is not, you know, is not a person. But for a moment, imagine, you need to say, law, 
you have wholly overstepped your bounds. I, I understand what you are, law. You are a guide for my life so that I can begin to live more like God. But what you are not and will never be is my Savior. That is Jesus Christ alone. And my righteousness is holy in him. If you begin to feel like God is not going to hear your prayer, if you begin to feel like you've gone too far, if you feel like there, that you're removed from grace, if you feel like you need to sit in your room and cry for days and days and days, you need to say, law, you've gone too far. Because you've forgotten that you are dead to the law and the law can no longer harm you because in Christ Jesus you are perfect before God the Father. His righteousness imputed to you, your sin imputed to him once and for all, past, present, and future. Through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. The moral imperatives are now lived in my life out of a grace, gratitude motive and nothing else. Because if I think it's me and I think it's me getting to God, I am putting myself in the place of Jesus and he alone sits in that place. You want to understand why we worship, why we jump around, why we take worship really seriously and we crank it up on Sundays? Because when we understand what Jesus has done for us, worship is not just this little quiet kind of thing. It is actually bubbling out of our very beings. It's 100%. It's toes and shins and every part of me says, Jesus, you alone, I did nothing to deserve this. That's worship. I've been crucified with Christ. And Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In me. Come on, would you say that? Just come on, hand over the heart. Oh, can't, no. Uh, <laughs> just hand over your heart. In me. Say that with me. Say, in me. Christ in me. In me. This week, 33 of our leaders went to ARC Conference. It's the church planting organization that we launched with uh, three months ago, just over three months ago. Mm. And uh, it was phenomenal. I can't believe how great 33 of our people took time off work and paid for a conference so that they could go and learn how to do church better. Like, that's crazy, right? That's amazing. The people that just care so much about seeing God move in this city. Shifting the culture, not just having great church services, but actually shifting the culture of our city and of our nation and believing that we're called to be an influence and stepping up to another level in the way that we minister and serve and the culture that we set in this house. 33 of our people did that this week. It was amazing. It was absolutely phenomenal. What I want to do for a minute, on the last night, one of my closest friends, Pastor Jonathan Lambert, got up and just absolutely preached a phenomenal message, praise God. Such an anointed word. But he, he shared an illustration, and I want to just quickly share it with you, because he shared an illustration about having recently given blood. And Jonathan and I are great friends, and we regularly plan our, and prepare our messages together. And so I actually knew kind of in advance he was going to go give blood, because he said to me one week, he's like, hey, man, I'm going to go give blood, because uh, I want to I wanna give an illustration on giving blood. And I'm like, bro, your motives are so pure right now. Like... <laughs> Like, I'm going to love my wife because we're doing a relationship series. Like, dude, that is messed up. <laughs> so he says, I'm going to go give blood. And he goes and gives blood and finishes giving blood and goes to the cookie and juice area. And uh, um, he meets a guy there who's given blood 746 times. He's doing the math. He's like, how is that even possible? This guy actually tell, told him, on average, it's just like over... Uh, just not quite once a week that he gives blood. I don't even know how that's possible. This guy, Norman, and Johnny says to him, he says, Did you, uh, are you trying to pay back for some crime that you committed? Do you have like some sort of guilt complex on your life? Um, do you know someone that needs this? And he just said to him, you know what, I just came to a realization at some point that I've got something in me that somebody else needs to be alive. So Paul's saying right here, Christ in me. We don't come to a church every week to sit in chairs and have some moralist person stand up on a platform and say, go and do better. You need to understand that my life is as jacked up as yours. Every ounce of everything we do in this place is only ever because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
why we do what we do. The 40 people that are on team this morning serving people in our church, we don't do it because we needed someone to check in your kids. We said to our teams this morning before we prayed, it's not the role you play, it's the spirit you do it with. It's Christ in you. All over the world today, kids are getting checked in. But the kids in our church, they're getting checked in, and we want your life to be changed. Why? Because Not because we've got anything. We're not better than anybody else. We just, I just said we're all jacked up. Christ in you. It's in you to give. Yeah, that's the, I guess that's the tagline. It's in you to give. I woke up early this morning to pray for you that you would have that realization. That you are not a mere church attender. You didn't take some of your time so that you could attend church. You are here because Christ is in you to give. You don't even have to leave this place without taking an opportunity to take of that deposit that is in your life and give it away. Come on, that's, that's, that's how ministry works. You don't, we're going to have some prayer time together at the end of church, but you don't need special prayer time. You just need to have your eyes open all the time for giving away, giving away. And uh, here's, here's an illustration. I, I, I love this. Our three-year-old, who's very funny, um, she gets it from her mom. Uh, she has taken, she's, she's given my mom a new nickname. So our three-year-old has given my mom a new nickname. And the nickname makes no sense. It is in no way connected to my mom's name, her person, what she looks like, or what she does. My mom's name is Ruth. My three-year-old has now taken to calling her Big D. <laughs> so we went downtown this week to take my parents out for dinner. And we were on Robson Street. And I, you know, we went to a, a nice restaurant. And then we finished at the restaurant. We put Avia in the car, and she opens up the sunroof, and she stands up on the armrest, and she's looking out the, the, the roof of our car, and she's shouting down Robson Street, Big D! <laughs> Big D, I love you, Big D! Everyone's thinking, like, my mom's name is Donna or something, you know? Like, Big D, come back! Big D, I love you, Big D! It's phenomenal. It's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. It's not connected to who she is or what she does or what her name is. We cannot figure out for any reason why she calls my mom Big D. So it is with the gospel. So it is with the imputation of grace to your life. So it is with justification that says God actually looks at you and because he sees Christ in you through faith, he declares you righteous all day, every day. It doesn't make sense. It's not connected to what you do or anything that can be seen on the outside of you. But it's who he sees you as. So when you are feeling broken down by sin and robbed of the joy in your life, you need to look at the law and say, Law, I'm Big D. I'm justified. It makes no sense. It's not connected to my name or who I am or what I look like or what I do. But Jesus has said that's who he sees me as. I'm Big D. I'm free. Paul attacks the critique that this is too easy. No, understand, the thing that will make you want to look like God is when you understand what God looks like. The reason you want to obey the moral imperatives of the law to get God's character and his heart in your life is not religion. You will want to be like God, follow after who he is, when you understand who he is. So Paul closes out this powerful we're just two chapters in. This is going to be good, right? It's going to be a good series. Like, Paul, all he's really done so far is said, those guys are telling you the wrong thing. The best doctrinal stuff is yet to come. Come on, somebody. So here's how he closes. <clears throat> and I got to be honest with you. I wrestled with this message close. I wrestled with it because... I know the critique that some people have of church in North America, and I don't wholly disagree with it, that it's just all about us. I don't disagree with that critique. I think there's a lot of us that really need to get a vision of what Christ died for us so that it actually does something in our lives, like in a much, much more radical way than showing up at church. 
So I'm all on board on that. But I can't not preach the Bible. And the Bible says some radical stuff about the way God looks at us. This is what we find here in the close of this second chapter. And so I'm praying that as I share these words, that they cause us to lean in. Paul says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So what he's, he could stop right there. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So I was this other person and I was crucified to Christ and now I have faith in Jesus. He could stop right there. But he goes on and he says two things. And these are the two things that constantly inspire that faith he has in God. Two aspects of God's character and his nature. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Two things. Who Number one, who loved me. And number two, gave himself for me. Paul is saying that the thing that inspires faith in him, the faith that he lives with, the faith that drives his life, the faith that causes him to give of himself, Literally, as he says, my life is like a drink offering poured out before God. Why? Because he has faith in God. And what has he seen in God? That God loves me and he gave himself for me. He loves and he gives. He loves and he gives. He loves and he gives. <clears throat> what does this do to us in community? When you realize Christ is in you and he loves and he gives and he loves and he gives and he loves and he gives and it's who he is. What does that do for us in community? Number one, it means that you can't come into this place anymore staring down at your shoes. You can't come into this place staring down at your brokenness saying, woe is me. Nor can you come in and say, look at all the stuff I've got. I've got it figured out. The gospel, the gospel is a complete neutralizer. Because the only thing that matters is my faith in God and that he loves and gives and he loves and he gives. So understand, if you come into this place broken and looking down at your shoes and saying, I'm just, woe is me. You can't stay there. Why? Because he is in you. It's not that you won't be sad or broken or frustrated or angry or disappointed or abandoned, deserted, hurt. Doesn't mean that those things don't happen. It means that you cannot stay stuck there. Why? Because he lives in you and he loves and he gives and he loves and he gives and he loves and he gives. Same thing with our stuff. You can't come in like, I've got the stuff and I've got, I got the outfit, I got the dress code, I got it all figured out, I'm looking, I got myself together. No, the gospel also neutralizes that. Why? Because it's just Christ in you. In you. He loves. And he gives, and he loves, he gives, and he loves. Come on, somebody. And he gives. This, this means that we are not mere passive participants. This love and give, this love and give changes us to the place that what do we do? We love and we give. It changes us from the inside out so we no longer just passively participate with the gospel as mere mental assent. We actually participate and say, if God loves and God gives, then I love and I give. And the law, you got no power over me, but you are a guide for my life because I want to be like the God who loves and gives and loves and gives and loves and gives. Come on, will you stand up to your feet? We're going to sing this song that really for us is the anthem of this series. So I will boast in Christ alone, his righteousness and not my own. God, I thank you for this message today. Not my words, not man's words, but the very glory of God that you looked down from all eternity and said, I love and I give. We give you praise in this